In this uh, segment of the presentation, we're going to talk a little bit about the uniforms that the soldiers during World War II would have worn, and also some of the equipment that they would have uh, also had attached to their body, uh, primarily being this webbing. Um, but first of all, the, uh, the uniform, uh, this is a pattern 37 uniform, um, designating that it was uh, designed and kind of came into service in 1937. Um, probably first look, you can see it's, uh, it's, it's made out of a fairly coarse wool um, material and it, uh, from experience it is, it is quite itchy um, until you get used to wearing it. Um, the soldiers had wool pants as well. Uh, they wore uh, a boots uh, very similar to what you'd see a soldier wearing today just uh, from you know back 75 80 years ago now and uh, they wore some gaiters as well around the pant legs of the boots to uh, keep the mud the dirt um, maybe critters in the trenches out of their boots as well um, as you look on this uniform here you can see the shoulder um, you first got the nationality for Canada um, next down from that, you've got the green circle and the blue square. Uh, the blue square was to designate uh, soldiers that were a member of the second Canadian division um, of uh, the infantry, the army. Uh, the blue or the green circle above is uh, to designate the actual unit the soldier was in within that division. And this particular one is uh, for the first battalion Royal Regiment of Canada. And this being uh, close to myself because my grandfather was a member of that regiment uh, during World War II. Um, moving on to that, we've also got a cap up here. This was actually towards the start of the war. The enlisted guys uh, during World War II would have been wearing this. It wasn't what they would have worn in combat. In combat, they would have worn a, uh, a hard hat, a tin um, hat to uh, protect from debris and things flying around. It wasn't bulletproof or uh, uh, wouldn't protect them from all hazards, but it would uh, it would protect them certainly from some. Um, moving on to that, we get the uh, the webbing here. Soldiers need to carry a lot of items. They need to carry would be it grenades or um, rations or ammunition for their rifles or even things like uh, field dressings if they if they were injured, first aid kits. They need to carry their water. So if you can see here on this side. We have a canteen. It's actually wrapped in a wool cloth as well, and just with a basic cork on the uh, on the top here, a little cork stopper. So it's not as modern as what you'd see today with the light plastic stuff. This is actually fairly heavy, filled with water. Um, these pouches up front were used for several different things. You could carry uh, small two-inch mortar bombs in there. They could carry grenades. They could carry ammunition. Um, maybe they had some rations they could slip in there. They're kind of a multi-use um, carrying tool or carrying pouch. On the side here, you can see the large bayonet. This is uh, a little bit different than what the troops ended the war with. As you can see, it's quite large and, uh, and unwieldy. It probably get tied up in, in your legs a little bit. Um, but uh, this was actually what they started the war with and it was actually what the troops used in World War I as well. Um, as the war progressed, we'll talk a little bit later, um, they got into a simplification of some of this stuff and, and, and they, uh, things became smaller, um, in some cases lighter, uh, but they definitely became a lot, uh, a lot, a lot different than they, they began the, the war with. Um, then just off to the side here, we've got, uh, a pair of wire cutters. Um, and when you look inside here, it's going to, um, bring your attention to some of these markings here. I know it'll be difficult to see, um, but you have to trust me with this. There's uh, ways of identifying what each piece of uh, equipment the manufacturer was and the year it was produced. This uh, particular one was produced in 1942. And you may be able to see this uh, symbol here. It's, it's actually the Canadian acceptance uh, stamp that all uh, equipment got when it entered service. We actually have another one here. This is just a tunic showing what would be on the inside. It would be on the inside of the flap of the tunic, but same thing, you may be able to see that uh, acceptance mark there. And uh, one of the other interesting things to note with all the equipment is, is how the equipment started to be made in all these uh, companies that previous to the war were not involved in making equipment for the war effort. Uh, this tunic, uh, for instance, was made by Tip Top Tailors. 
Um, not sure if you all recognize that, but I'm sure some parents and grandparents uh, of yours would probably recognize that name as it was quite a large name in the fashion and clothing industry back in the day. So other companies uh, got involved with this depending on if it was uniforms or weaponry or whatever for the war effort. There's another one here as well you can see here this actual item is identified by what it is it's a signal satchel so the radio men would have uh, carried these bags and would have had radio supplies and things in them but again you, there's uh, that acceptance mark you can see there as well and there's also a date this one for instance was made in 1944. so one of the things that this helps us do when we're kind of looking at some of this stuff is you can actually see the evolution of the equipment through the war uh, the different years, um, how the equipment was made, and how it actually changed from manufacturer to manufacturer as well. In this segment of the presentation, we're gonna talk about some of the weapons that the uh, individual soldiers would have been carrying um, on their person uh, during the war. This is again, all World War II items on the table, but there is some crossover uh, with World War I and the interwar period between World War I and World War II, where a lot of arms development took place. Uh, the first item on the table up front here is what's referred to as a Sten gun. And it's in a class of uh, firearms that's referred to as a submachine gun. And the reason why it's called a submachine gun is because it doesn't shoot a full powered rifle round, it actually shoots a pistol round. This one in particular shoots nine millimeter. So generally, if you hear the term submachine gun, it's pretty safe to assume that it fires a little bit smaller cartridge than a full power rifle would. Um, therefore, they are not good at extended range. So they're more something to be used in closer range combat, uh, generally in, are more in particular um, in through uh, urban warfare and cities and things. And that was a lot more prevalent in World War II than it was in World War I. Um, so the interesting thing about this um, uh, firearm was it was built actually in Long Branch. There is a facility down there and that's just on uh, Lake Ontario just in between Mississauga and Toronto and uh, there's an arms factory there so this has a little bit of a local uh, feel to the, uh, the Ontario area. Uh, the next firearm in the middle here is uh, what's known as a Lee Enfield. This uh, particular one there's several different versions of the Lee Enfield rifle and it had a lot of different uh, innovations that uh, took place from World War, well actually before World War One, turn of the century, and they were used all the way up um, into the 70s. And actually our Canadian Rangers have just recently retired the old Lee Enfields. They were using them up in the Arctic um, up until very recently, like last few years. Um, this version is the number four Mark I. It was uh, the improved version. Uh, the World War I version uh, was the number one Mark III. And they found that there was some uh, things that they could do during World War II to speed up the process to make them and also make them more reliable and more accurate. And this is kind of the culmination of all those innovations. Um, and then also the interesting thing with this one, it was also made at the same place this Sten gun was made. It was made at Long Branch as well. Um, so there's a lot of uh, local people and, um, and probably a lot of, a lot of local women um, in that area were working in that factory uh, during, during the war. Um, the next one at the back here is, uh, it's a Bren gun and what the classification that it's in is a light machine gun. Um, it's uh, capable of semi-automatic fire and also fully automatic fire. Um, it holds 30 round magazines. It has quick change barrels and it's another example of uh, local arms production. This was actually made just down the road from Long Branch in a factory in Toronto called Inglis. And some of you may recognize that name. Um, if you look at some fridge and stoves and appliances, you'll see that name on them. And uh, they converted over from their, their production pre-war and started building light machine guns. They're also building uh, Browning automatic pistols and they're also building boys anti-tank rifles. So um, that's how they contributed to the war effort. Um, light machine guns take quite a bit of ammunition to feed them. So. Over here, we've got an example of a box of magazines, and, and this is full of these, uh, these magazines. So generally what you had was a crew that would operate this. There's a crew of two, uh, two soldiers. Um, one soldier would carry the actual rifle and operate this uh, himself, and then the other would change barrels and change magazines for him and make sure the thing was running. 
and he'd also you know alert him of uh, any um, targets that uh, he needed to engage. Um, one of the interesting things about the start of World War II to the end of World War II was the, and I referred to this in the previous segment, was wartime expediency and how the manufacturing of things changed. And this is seen in the bayonets. This, this bayonet actually goes on the predecessor to the, this Lee Enfield, the World War I version, which was also used in World War II, but it actually was phased out for this uh, particular rifle. But if you can see, this is quite large. Um, there's a lot of intricate little pieces on this. There's wood grips, there's um, quite high quality screws and hardware used to put it all together. Um, and I think you can probably appreciate it. It would take quite a bit of time and material to produce this. So by the end of the war, when they started to develop this rifle here, this is what the bayonet looked like. And I don't know if it's clear uh, from that angle, but this is, is, is pretty much made for the most part of one piece of steel, and it's just a sharpened rod. Um, very, very simple to build, very quick. Um, and the materials, there's no wood on this. Um, it's just all steel. Um, we can see this uh, repeated in almost everything. Um, they did it in the uniforms, they did it in the webbing, um, firearms, for example. Um, it's almost, this is probably one of the best examples of wartime expediency. Um, if you look at this uh, up close, there's almost no parts that have been mass manu or manufactured by machining. Almost everything on this is welded and stamped parts, tubes and flat pieces that have had, had holes drilled in them. It's very, very basic. If you compare it to this, which has an incredible amount of effort, material, um, a lot of time spent, um, and even this particular light machine gun, um, this is the early war version. There's also a later war version. And if you look at it, it didn't have this fancy sight on it. And it had little bits and pieces from the barrel removed. Um, it was much more smoother and streamlined. Um, so that's an overall um, example of what, uh, what the troops would carry and uh, how things changed throughout the war. So in this segment of the presentation, we're gonna talk about some items you see on the table here. Um, primarily kind of ordnance uh, would be referred to as ordnance or the items that would be, but they're still carried by the soldier and used by the soldier. Um, the first item here, a lot of you may um, recognize as being uh, a grenade, which it is. This one in particular is called a Mills bomb. Um, these were uh, used during World War I. They were changed and updated a little bit for World War II, but essentially the same thing. Um, you can see it's kind of that, got that uh, stereotypical pineapple shape that you would uh, often see even in uh, some of today's grenades. Um, what you may not understand is the reason why it's shaped like a pineapple. This is a fragmentation grenade. So the whole reason for this grenade is to break up into small pieces um, for use against uh, personnel. And these are nasty, jagged little pieces of metal when they come off here. So you do not want to be anywhere in the area of, uh, of one of these when they go off. What a lot of people don't understand with the grenade, they know kind of you pull the pin and you throw it and then it explodes. What um, a lot of us haven't been able to see is the actual, what actually takes place inside that grenade when you pull the pin. And here I have uh, an example of a training uh, grenade that's been quartered. So they've actually just taken a quarter slice out of this thing so you can kind of see the internals of what's going on inside. Um, so that is, this is that pin, that ring here. And what it's doing is it's holding on this lever here, sometimes referred to as a spoon, but it's essentially just a lever. And what, what that lever is doing is there's a small little groove cut in this little uh, uh, pin running down through here with a spring under high tension. And what's, what this is trying to do is that spring is trying to open up and force this pin down there. But this little edge here that catches inside of there on this lever is holding that. And then of course the pin is holding the lever down. So that's what keeps it safe. So when the pin is pulled out, as long as the soldier holds that lever down, nothing happens. It's the same as having the pin in. It's when they go to throw it, that spring tension there takes over and it wants to force this pin down, which flings that lever out. So what happens is, is down in the very bottom here, there's a little copper colored or gold colored piece down here. And what that is, is a little primer. And it's got a small little uh, charge in there, 
which when it's struck very hard by this uh, pin under spring tension, it ignites this little fuse. And if you can see, there's a little yellow kind of piece of cord, almost looks like a piece of rope. That's a fuse. That's similar to like what you would see on a cartoon or whatever, the fuse going towards a dynamite. Same kind of deal. What that fuse is, is that's your delay. So you hear about the seven second delays or nine second delays, some are shorter, some may be longer. Well, that fuse, depending on what it's made out of and the length of it, that determines your delay in the grenade. And then this little, this silver piece up here, you see this other silver kind of pin shaped looking thing, that's your detonator. That's the final part in this reaction that detonates the entire grenade. And this brown section here would be full of an explosive material. In this case, it was black powder. And when that detonator went off, it would detonate the black powder and then it would all go off. So, so as you can see, there's kind of a number of things going on within a grenade. It's not just as simple as uh, pulling the pin and it goes bang. There's quite a few different things going on. What's interesting about these is this, uh, this end cap comes off and, and then you can actually see this entire assembly. And for safekeeping and transport, these detonators were, and fuses assemblies were transported separately from the grenade and that would make it safe so that it, could, it wasn't possible to go off. Interesting thing also about grenades was they weren't just thrown, they were also shot out of rifles. And all they had to do is on this little end cap that I pulled off, there's a little threaded piece in there. What they would do is they would thread on this uh, plate and this would slide down into another piece that would fit onto the rifle and they could shoot what looked to be like a blank round, there was no bullet in it, and the gases would build up behind this plate and launch this grenade out. And what they would do with that is they would actually pull a pin before they put it in, but when they would put this into that little tube, that tube wall would hold down that lever, that spoon, and it wouldn't let it go off until it left. But the second it left that tube off of the rifle, then the timing would go on. But it extended the range. They could fire these out to 100 yards or so with it, whereas you could never throw that. You'd need to be uh, uh, quite, the, maybe somebody that played baseball or something could uh, whip one like that, but they were, they were fairly heavy and not that easy to throw those kind of distances. So that kind of covers the grenades. Another kind of explosive that the uh, troops would carry with them and use were uh, called mortars. You may have seen these, they're, uh, they're still used today. Um, in the in the army and what they are is a tube that's set up on roughly a 45 degree angle they they vary that angle depending on what range they want to shoot these uh, bombs at but the advantage of these things for the for the soldier at the time was is these things can be lobbed up and over a wall if you think of a bullet it travels in a straight line or relatively straight line if somebody's behind a wall you can't get at them because they're behind that wall and, and that straight line will impact the wall these can actually go up and over and come and descend down onto them. They can also descend down from cliff tops and things like that. It was used to quite, uh, quite an effect during the Dieppe raid. Um, the Germans were lobbing mortars in some cases down onto the beach from over the wall. And of course the, uh, the troops couldn't see them uh, that were, were, they were trapped down below the wall. Um, the examples we have here today are two uh, examples that would have been used in World War II. The smaller one up front is a two inch mortar and the uh, one in the rear is a three inch mortar. There's, there's quite a difference between the weight. There's a lot of uh, steel in the front of this three inch mortar. Um, so it would produce uh, substantially more um, fragmentation and shrapnel than this one would. Um, one of the other things that's interesting to know about mortars is they weren't just always used for high explosive uh, use. They were used for cover. So there's also mortars that were made with a smoke uh, element to them. And when they were fired up, they would, use, they would produce a, a whole bunch of smoke once they hit the ground. And that would cover the troops' movement so that they could move around without the enemy seeing them. The other one that was kind of interesting, did the exact opposite, kind of, it was a starlit uh, mortar. And what that would be is they would fire it up into the air and there would be a flare attached to it. And that would be ignited uh, up in the air and it would cast a great light onto the battlefield. So it would actually allow you to see things as opposed to the smoke. And then the examples here are what are known HE is what you see stamped on them if you have a look at them. And that stands for high explosive. And these are more of just kind of the anti-personnel uh, style mortar that were just made to damage things around it. Um, vehicles um, and also of course human targets as well. Um, one of the things that uh, soldiers had to protect themselves from, in some cases with mortars, a lot of times with shells, um, was chemical and biological stuff, um, elements in the shells. 
Um, you hear about the chlorine gas and things being used in World War I. It wasn't as big of a thing in World War II like it was uh, in World War I battlefields. But nonetheless, the soldiers did learn from that and, and uh, they, the armies did issue gas masks for the soldiers. Um, you can also see an example of the tin lid that this would be a standard infantry soldier would wear. It's got some netting on it. Uh, this netting could be uh, used for concealment. It, uh, it breaks up any sort of shine that you may get on the helmet. They also, you'll see guys will, uh, or some of the soldiers when they were coming uh, onto the beaches of D-Day, you'll see some of the footage where they have like almost like cattails and reeds and all kinds of stuff hanging off them. And that's for concealments to break up that pattern of a human object so you're not recognized from a distance. Um, the last item we have on the table, this is kind of a real treat to have here because right now we're at the Aurelia Library and this was actually made at the Tud Oak factory um, just a block away from here which is now City Hall. And this um, is a shell from a, a Piat. It's kind of a strange name, a Piat, but like a lot of things in the army and in the military, they use acronyms. Acronyms being the first letter um, denotes a word. Uh, a PIA stands for Projector Infantry Anti-Tank. So it kind of gives you a little bit of a description of what's going on here with this thing. This wouldn't be really used to be launched at uh, um, soldiers. It's more specifically for anti-tank operations. And what happened was in World War I, the tank started to develop a little bit, but it had very light armor, fairly light armor. And what they found uh, at the time was if they just built uh, rifle rounds big enough, they just build them larger and larger, the, the actual rifle round could penetrate the armor. What happened in, during the interwar period and as we kind of get into World War II, the armor got much, much, much thicker. There was no way that a projectile fired from a shoulder fired rifle could penetrate. So what you're, here, what you're seeing here is this round is what's referred to as a shaped charge and it concentrates the explosion to, it, it's got a hardened uh, material in it to help penetrate into the tank and then blast a charge into the tank and actually crack the armor just like an eggshell. Um, so yeah, this is kind of just an interesting, again, an interesting example of how companies, the Tud Oak factory is making vehicles and um, I believe ice cream scoops at one time as well and some other different, uh, different items. During the war, they had several, uh, um, different things they were building, but one of them was the uh, was the Piat round. In this segment of the presentation, I wanted to touch on a little bit of um, advice and information for you on researching a soldier. Um, it may be a, a soldier in your family, but it may be uh, in some cases just uh, a soldier you find some a random story about, maybe while you're doing research on another project and you want to dig into their life a little bit, see kind of what uh, what they were doing during the war, and maybe even uh, find out a little bit before and after the war as well. Um, what I have here is a, uh, is a kit bag. And you can see up top here, there's this, there's this big number. Um, this was referred to as the soldier's uh, service number. Um, in this case, this is uh, the kit bag of Jack Poulton. Um, he's a veteran of the Dieppe uh, raid over in France in 1942 and uh, he served at the remainder of the war in POW camp, Stalag 8B. And if, for example, I wanted to do some research on an individual, in this case, um, Jack, I could take his service number and uh, you can go to the Library and Archives um, website. And there they have a couple of different um, things you can, tools you can use. Um, the one I was gonna touch on was the service files of the soldiers. Now, First World War has uh, a complete listing of the Canadians who were in uh, the First World War, and you can search the service number, and in many cases, you can have very good luck at um, finding the individual you're looking for. One word of caution is, especially with the vast quantity of them, if the soldier has a common name, for instance, maybe their name was John Brown, for instance, you're going to find an absolute enormous amount of soldiers there. In this case, this becomes almost vital to have this service file, unless you have a ton of time to search for um, that individual's service file, you'd have to open up every single service file and try and find that one. If the person has a unique name, you may get lucky and it may be just the first person or the only person on the list and you may be able to open it that way. But if you find the service file, it'd be great. Service file was, uh, or the service number, sorry, was uh, located in several locations. You'll see it on a lot of documentation. So if you have the discharge papers, 
of the uh, of the individual. First World War medals have it uh, inscribed on the side of them. Uh, in some cases, some some families or some soldiers did put them on Second World War medals, but it wasn't uh, wasn't the standard protocol. You can find it on, for instance, things like kit bags. Sometimes you'll find it on a canteen. Sometimes you may find it on a helmet. You may find it <clears throat> written on the inside rim of a helmet, or you could find it on the liner. So if you have those sort of items and you see a number that kind of resembles this, it doesn't have to have the same uh, configuration, but if you see a letter with a number, there's a pretty good chance it might be the soldier's service file. Um, this one denotes in particular, this B denotes that this soldier uh, enlisted in uh, central Ontario. Um, you can tell a few things from the service file. The number will give a, an indication of, um, I guess, where in the war, if you knew groups of numbers, where they enlisted at what point. But this first letter will kind of indicate where they enlisted. Um, that can be a bit of a red herring though as well. So um, it, even though your uh, relative or some of your researching may be from British Columbia, and they, it could be possible that they have a B as well. Um, they may have served under a regiment in, uh, in the province of Ontario. So um, don't discount that if you are looking for it. It could, it could be a, a red herring. Uh, and in this case, you actually see some of the research that's been done. Um, we're lucky with Jack because um, we know lots about him and there's uh, all kinds of information about it, but other people you wouldn't be able to find. Some of them you won't be able to even find photographs. Um, some of them didn't have very many relatives. Some of the photos got destroyed in a house fire or whatever. So it can be very difficult to locate these. Um, with the vast amount of newspapers online, uh, the archives online, you can search through there. Um, one of the particularly nice resources is Ancestry, um, which until Christmas, the early library has for free on the website. So if you're really anxious to get going on it right now, you can do that for free. Um, there's a lot of things you can find on um, in different books. Sometimes you'll find firsthand accounts in books if you know the soldier is involved in a particular battle. Um, you can have a look there and maybe you'll be able to find out some information that way. There's also a thing called the War Diaries. Um, those you have to uh, request usually through Ottawa, although it's not always the case. Sometimes you'll find copies of them on random websites. Um, those tell where the soldiers were in that particular unit at that particular time. We'll even find weather updates and training and what they were doing at the time. It usually doesn't center, center out a particular soldier, um, but it does give you uh, context as to what they were going through at the time. So those are just a few tools that you can use um, to maybe do some research. But what I would strongly encourage you to do is to try and find the service number if you can. It will really help you on your search. Um, definitely the full name. The other thing you have to watch with names too, I've, I've encountered this in particular um, on cenotaphs, is a lot of times the names were different than the actual names, their birth names. So you have to be uh, diligent in that as well because a lot of guys went by their nicknames or whatever and some of them are actually titled that way or at least the first initial is actually on the cenotaph that way and it can kind of again it can be another red herring that can kind of throw you for a loop so you have to investigate a little bit and you have to sometimes you have to go through a lot of hoops to find the information um, but it is well worth it once you do start uncovering the information it can be uh, it can be absolutely incredible um, but anyway, that's a, that's a little bit of the information and uh, have a look online. There's lots of resources there and, uh, and good luck with your search.